Welcome to the Lone Star Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This is episode 26. I'm joined by co-host Austin Zam Hariri. Our guest this week is Mihaela Plisa. She is going to be running for House District 70, Texas House District 70. That's Collin County. Welcome to the show. Hey, thank you guys so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. Yes, thank you for having or for, for being here. I know um, obviously we're definitely in the, the heat of primary season. So thank you for taking the time to jump on on what we believe is a very important subject. Absolutely. I think that more people should be having this conversation. So I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to use my platform to kind of, you know, extend the conversation around this issue and kind of dive into why, you know, I want to be here and why cannabis is on my lit. It's, 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 it's strange. Like, I, I'm glad that people are, we have candidates that are making it a priority. And I literally thought about that today. It's just strange that, that we have people who are like, oh, I don't understand. That's not a priority right now. And it's like, I agree. It shouldn't be a priority. And if you think it's so level, it's like so low, why don't we just end it? And that's why we make this a priority because there's so much, there's dominoes that fall out behind this. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a little bit about me. Um, I have been an advocate. I've been a protester. I have marched. Um, I have lobbied. Um, I have two degrees in political science. I went to the University of North Texas and have a bachelor's degree in poli sci. I then went on to SMU and got a master's degree in political science. And, you know, I started small businesses here in North Texas, you know, working with people building their enterprises, using the internet. And I was always active in my community. Um, in 2011, I, you know, really got in with normal and really got into kind of going down to Austin and lobbying for some of the legislation that was happening. Texas looked like they had, you know, were moving forward at pushing legislation around cannabis. We had Republicans like uh, David Simpson that were filing bills. I mean, this was not a, a, a partisan issue. Texas was heading in the right direction. Um, and, you know, basically was always, this was always kind of an issue that I felt like Texas was lacking. Um, but in 2017, you know, after Donald Trump was elected, I was like, okay, y'all, the protesting, the advocating, all this, it's not enough. And so I quit my job <laughs> and I took my two political science degrees and I went to Austin. And for the last five years, I've been a legislative director working for Democrats in Austin. Um, so I have seen, you know, this legislation coming in and out of the Capitol. And I know that this isn't a polarizing issue. Uh, and that's why I feel like we need to have more courageous representation who is having these conversations on the campaign trail instead of some of the stuff that's polarizing us. And so that's kind of, you know, I started my activism around this issue and that's why I'm not going to back down now that I actually have a platform um, to talk about it. You're talking about, I love it. No, talking, go ahead, Jesse. You were talking about doing, you, you'd start a couple of small businesses. I was asked if you could tell us about a few of those businesses that you've started and apparently operate. You have experience doing this. Yeah, so right at, you know, when I was younger, um, around 22, 23, I paired up with some women and we started manufacturing companies here in North Texas. I had a friend of mine who was doing swimwear, all handmade manufactured swimwear. We had, you know, sewing machines, we had staff in there and we were doing, you know, Miami Swim Week um, with her, with her fashion designs. I think Kim Kardashian wore one of her swimsuits once. Uh, that was a big deal. And then I had a friend who wanted to do the same thing, but in loungewear. And so we did like yoga wear and we were manufacturing yoga wear and loungewear. Um, and so then extending that to different kind of like fashion merchandising departments, you know, slides, shoes and things like that. But my passion has always been in political science, right? I mean, I was always the one that's been watching the TV. I was really aware of what was going on, you know, internationally especially around cannabis. I was very familiar with what Mark Emery was doing in Canada and had been following that movement up there. And so, um, you know, I realized though, when I got down to the Capitol that issues are more than just, you know, you know, cannabis, they're 
was a plethora of things that opened up to me. And I, you know, grew up legislatively, I think. But at the end of the day, this issue needs to be addressed. Um, it, and for so many different things, not just medical, uh, not just monetarily and financially. I mean, we have medical refugees right now living in other states because they cannot live in the state of Texas. That's, that's a problem. I like how you describe there's pretty much there's the classroom equivalent of what you know for political science. And then there's what you learn by physically being there and filling in the gaps on how the reality of how things are put together and how things really work. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of why I jumped into this race. Uh, this district is a new district. House District 70 here in the southern part of Collin County was redistricted in the last legislative session. And they did that because of the pressure that what the, the advocates, what the, the people on the ground here in Collin County had been doing uh, for the last five, six years. And it had been trending blue. And to save two House seats, um, they created House District 70, which is made up of about 13 um, precincts in North Dallas, about 29 in Plano, one in Allen and one in Richardson. Um, the district literally looks like a bunny. And um, now this district is a Dem leaning seat. So it's probably the only Democratic pickup that the House of Representatives stands to pick up on the Dem side. It's a 50.4 Democrat leaning district with a 2.6 independent vote. So the person that has to be put up in November against a Republican needs to attract independent voters or else they're not gonna win. And I believe that it's not just about getting elected, it's about being effective once you get down to Austin. And I've been you know, down there for the last five years, I've seen pretty bad leadership and I've seen non-courageous, you know, I've seen cowardice leadership. So that's why I got in the race because I knew it was gonna be hard and I knew that I can be effective on day one. Yeah, I think it's really incredible. Um, often we've been, Jesse and I, independently and together, have been working at the legislature uh, from an advocacy standpoint um, for many years. And so it's it's always nice when we talk to candidates and they understand the, the vernacular and the scope of what is cannabis reform and the many different branches that that really does entail. And also... <laughs> It's nice to have somebody who is intimate with the legislative process, specifically in Texas, and understands how like just crazy it is to get a, a bill, really even just an idea into legislative, you know, like a bill and then moving that all the way up to the governor's desk. So that's very refreshing. I think that a lot of people are really shocked to know that we are only in session 140 days. Um, and that we're only there every once every two years. I, I mean, I don't think that people understand how that drastically affects what we can get done and what become priorities. Um, I'm also really upset because I know that Democrats have been pushing cannabis reform for a really, really long time. And because we don't really hold a lot of majorities, um, you don't really see a lot of, um, Democrats having the opportunity to carry the legislation, you know, you see more of like a Stephanie Klitt um, carrying that stuff. And that's fine. I mean, I, I'm happy to see anything get through, um, but I would really like to be one of the champions um, of, of some great cannabis legislation. You know, y'all have been in the Capitol just as long as I have. And I remember the Dutton speeches in the committee where he's shaking the packet and you're saying, we're putting people in jail for less than what's in the sugar packet. And I'm inspired by that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a student of that. And so that's, that's what I hope to, to be more of is to, to be a serious voice around this issue. Um, this isn't just, kids that want to get high, right? This is like veterans. Um, I worked for Defense and Veterans Affairs as a staffer, multiple sessions, and I can't tell you how many times veterans have come into my office 
and they've got their pill bottle and they're saying, this is killing me. These pills are killing me. This is keeping me in a prison. I, when I go to Colorado or when I go to California and I can get access to this medicine, I feel opened up, you know, free. I feel like I can talk. I feel, I don't feel the pressures of my PTSD or my TBI or whatever, whatever. These people serve our country. Uh, they serve our state. I think that it's a shame that we're not listening to them when they are begging, begging us uh, for reform. I'd say one of the big things that we, 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 we want this to happen. And then like you mentioned, there's, there's people on, there on both sides of the aisle that they're trying to champion something. And it seems strange that a like, click goes forward and champions the medical side. And something I never thought I personally would have ever seen in person going to the legislative session was the committee hearings and how a committee hearing just partisanly can, can end a bill, even if it's a great bill. Yeah, I mean, um, I will tell you that's another reason why I'm running in this race is because, like I said before, I strongly believe that you need to be effective, not just elected. And Democrats right now, we have voter apathy because we haven't been effective. I have been effective in my capacity as a legislative director. The last five years, I've passed over a dozen pieces of legislation working for Democrats in a Republican majority house. Um, I feel confident that if I'm given the opportunity, I can move these pieces of legislation because I can meet people where they are at and have a conversation to them about why this is needed. Um, you know, I don't have to tell you guys about the, the committee process and what you guys said, you know, one person can kill a bill. And, you know, I pride myself on the fact that last session we had a bill. Um, my boss, Representative Lopez, had a bill for ECI, early childhood intervention programs. So this is like the most vulnerable of kids. This is zero to three year old kids. Right. And these are tests that insurance companies should be providing to see diagnostics for early interventions. If there's any sort of thing that we can test for to see any slow development, right? That bill went up in front of insurance committee, which is majority all Republicans. And because we were able to communicate with members on that committee, I was able to have a conversation with committee clerks and chiefs of staff. And we got the chair of that committee, Tom Oliverson, to be the only Republican to vote on that bill, which moved it to the House calendar. So that's the kind of results that I want to bring. You know, it's about finding the small sliver of space that you can fit in and saying, hey, please just do us this one solid. Just let it, let us just put it up on the calendar. And we got it to the we got it to the calendar. We ran out of time. But to have only one Republican vote on a bill to get it out, that's pretty powerful. And I believe I can do that for legislation around cannabis. I believe that we can have conversations about getting veterans care or patients care. I mean, come on. Greg Abbott even said that he's interested in looking at um, decriminalization and people, you know, putting people in jail for this stuff. So we, there is definitely an appetite there. And I'm willing to go in and see like what we can feed, right? If there's people that want something, let's try to give it to them. My serious concern though, isn't in the house. I mean, you guys have been there. My concern is with the Senate. We have Dan Patrick that leads the Senate and he has definitely come out that this is, he's against it. So we really need to fight hard to make sure that the Senate hears the house. And, and then we, that they take the legislation that we're sending over to them serious. We are going to go into our first sponsor break here at the Lone Star Collective. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This is episode 26. Our guest this week, Michaela Plisa. She is running for Texas House District 70. I'm joined by co-host Austin Zamhuri. We will be right back after this break. We 
we'd like to take a moment to talk about the Texas Cannabis Policy Conference. The Texas Cannabis Policy Conference gathers thought leaders and experts in the rapidly changing landscape of cannabis legalization. The event, hosted at Texas A&M University, is happening this spring, March 4th through the 6th, 2022. Attendees will include cannabis business owners, entrepreneurs, investors, policymakers, and allied health professionals. For more information, event details, and registration, visit www.texascannabisconference.org. Oak Cliff Cultivators is a sponsor of Texas Cannabis Collective and Lone Star Collective Podcast. Oak Cliff focuses on quality assurance with their hemp products while providing customer service to help you discover cannabinoids to meet your needs. Their product line includes hemp flower pre-rolls, CBG tinctures, edibles, Delta 8, and merch. For more information on their products quality or to shop online today, visit oakcliffcultivators.com or contact them at info at oakcliffcultivators.com. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast, distributed on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Facebook, and much more, to give Texans information regarding policy, industry, and culture. Here is this week's host, Jesse Williams and Austin Sam Hariri. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. I'm joined by co-host Austin Zamhuri. This is episode number 26. Our guest this week, Mihaela Plisa. She is running for Texas House District 70. How's everybody doing? I'm doing great. How was, how was the, the ice storm experience on your side in Collin County? Uh, this last go around or the time before? <laughs> <laughs> right. This one wasn't as bad, I think. But it's uh, pretty no. sad that we have all have PTSD from the experience. Once again, why we need to decriminalize um, and make medical cannabis available. If we're going to be traumatized by our electric grid, we should at least have the opportunity to relieve our stress in a natural way. I have no comment. I lived a little bit up north in New York. So I'm personally, I'm, I'm somewhat used to that, but I totally get it. Texas is not. I grew up in Texas. Texas yeah, is not equipped for that. To, but are you used to your like lights and water not working for a week because of a little oh, yes. cold? They they had issues. I was in upstate New York where in the summer and in the winter, because they're the buildings there are just so old, they're not meant they don't have like HVAC systems. So they're not really oh, well, prepped for that either. That's not what's yeah. going on with our system. Our system is that we don't our our grid isn't weatherized for extreme weather, right? And so Okay, so in Texas, our extreme weather is the summer. Our extreme weather isn't like winter. So yeah. we prepare for like scorching hot 110 summer days. Um, the issue with the grid and, and the grid is one of my my priorities. The issue with our grid is that what are we going to do when it's 110 outside and our grid fails? Because it's not weatherized. and People want to talk about what happened in February, but nobody really talks about what happened last summer when we almost lost the grid. And so what what are you going to do? I mean, here, yeah, okay, you burn your furniture, right? You, you get heat. But what are you going to do when it's 110 outside? How are we going to stay cool? That's that's why we need to fix the grid. Oh, and I, I totally understand what I did in the military was power plant operations. And it's something I, I kept telling people. I was like, the, the real answer is we need to bring more power online. We did not have when, enough power at all. When, what we did during during the all of that when the lights were out and um, you know the, the grid was collapsing and you know people didn't have water for five, six, seven days. It was kind of like, yeah, we could use those marijuana taxes right about now, couldn't we? Like that would be nice to have to contribute something to some kind of infrastructure. I mean, I totally agree. Look, um, here in Collin County, I see in my district, when I'm driving around to Block Walk, I'm seeing CBD shops everywhere, right? They're everywhere. Everywhere. They, these people, these small businesses, they're not getting, they didn't get into this because they want to run CBD shops. 
right? They got into this because they hope that Texas is going to wake up with the rest of the nation and is going to have a robust cannabis industry, which we should have had a long time ago. Um, And I mean, I think that if you want to be pro-business, you really have to have a conversation around around allowing people to come in and and have have their businesses here. So so one thing that you mentioned earlier, real quick, and I know this may be kind of like off topic, but you said you graduated from UNT, correct? Yes. I graduated from Denton Ryan, which is the the one of the high schools in Denton. So I've UNT is like big, you know, big part of my home and community. I'm a Denton Knight for life. And okay, so, absolutely, yes. Right, <laughs> I'm there great. with you. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, um, what what's the, what was your experience like in, in you know going to school in places like Denton, SMU, and how has that kind of like played into where you're at now? Oh, absolutely. So I loved my time at North Texas. I mean, I valued that time, you know, now thinking back, man, I should have done more. I should have not been, I think that when we're young, we're like, oh, I'm not cool. I can't join those clubs. You know, I think if I had (laughs) advice to like, tell like 18 year old Mihaela would be like, join everything because everybody is insecure and everybody doubts themselves. So just like go and be nice. And people will be like, wow, yeah, let's all go do this stuff. But I'm really, really, I think being on that campus, um, seeing all the viewpoints, having like spaces that people were talking really lit the activist fire underneath me. I was part of the um, MIO, which is like the Model International Organization group down at UNT. I was one of their founding members and got to go debate and do like, you know, pretend, do mock EU and do mock UN. And so, you know, doing this now on the campaign trail, I I look back at that and I I I'm very grateful for those experiences that I had in those groups and wish I would have done more. Um, At SMU, it was also an awesome experience, even though it is a private school and it's kind of fancy. um, I wasn't there on a scholarship or anything. You know, I was just like a normal kid there. I just always thought that was such an amazing school. And I had the opportunity to attend uh, their Simmons School of Humanities and Education. So I was one of their first graduates out of like any kind of political science program out of SMU. And because I was one of the first, they were really pumping a lot of programs. And that's when I got to be a part of the Young National Organization for Women. And that's where I met people like Gloria Steinem and had lunch with like one of the founding feminists, right? And I'm like, holy crap, like this is awesome. And she's asking me like, when did you realize you were a feminist? And, you know, I mean, those conversations kind of spark your passion for doing things and having those like one issues that drive you. Um, And I think that that's really important as a candidate to understand those issues because sometimes people will come vote for you just because of one thing. Like we see that all the time on the other, on the Republican side, like with abortion stuff. I mean, people like literally will come out just for that one issue. And, and I think Democrats, sometimes we weigh people down a lot with a lot of stuff. Like we're like fully fund everything and we want (laughs) to do. And so people get overwhelmed. Um, But once again, that's why I believe in this issue. I believe in this cause. I believe that cannabis can heal us, not just internally um, and mentally, but politically. I mean, it has bipartisan support. Um, People want freedom. People want, I mean, this freedom. Look, I, I remember ramp. Like, I remember when ramp started in 2011, 2012, like, I remember being in the committee hearings and listening to, like, Ann Lee speak, right? So, like, I mean, look, we're standing on the shoulders of legends, right? We need to continue their work. Absolutely. Thank Yes. And, wow, like, that's how we know how, like, like 
<laughs> on you are is when you're dropping names like Ann Lee and Ramp on this podcast, like then we know you're serious. <laughs> well, good. I mean, I am. I'm. I am serious. Look, what they were doing, you know, so long ago. What what her son Richard had has done in Oakland. I mean, these things need to be talked about. These these are the conversations that people need to have. If you're going to be a, a, a person that's going to make any difference at the state ledge, and, and you need to know the history um, of this issue because there is a specific reason why we don't have cannabis in Texas, and we need to fix it. Yeah, there's it's it's strange that like learning this complicated background, and you can read as much as you want in a textbook, but you don't really understand it. Like I said before, until you physically go to the Capitol. You listen to how they talk and the way they act, even like their body language about it. Go to offices, talk to legislative directors and bill, bill writers and things of that nature. And you'll say you really don't understand until you're doing those things. And you start seeing who's been involved and who's like shooting it down. Right. And I think also you, uh, the, de- the crazy amount of detail that goes into everything and the, like the, the politics on the ground that aren't happening in the actual pieces of legislation, but like person to person contact that are happening within that building. It's it's very convoluted. Yeah. And, and I think that's what I try to like tell people on the campaign trail, you know, people can sit here and say, you know, Oh, well you were a legislative director. You weren't the rep. You guys have been down there. I mean, you have read ledge council drafts and been like, uh, this is wrong. <laughs> This was not our intent at all. I've been in the offices to tell them those very things like this doesn't work. It's not how any it's not how any of it works. You really have to like the staff needs to know what they're doing. There needs to be attentiveness. Um, and then not just that, but it's like what I what the unique thing that I bring to the table is that I've built these relationships, with committee clerks, with other legislative staff, with other state reps. Right. And so that's why I'm kind of ready to go now or day one, whichever one you want to choose. And, you know, I know what to look for. I know how to read a bill. I know what to expect, you know, and a lot of people don't understand the new. I mean, I didn't understand the nuances. It literally took me. I've been down there now for three legislative sessions, four special sessions. I've worked with multiple, you know, freshmen. Um. I'm proud of, you know, the office that I'm in with Representative Lopez. We had made we we passed a constitutional amendment last last session, like with 89 percent in November up for to give a property tax exemption to our Gold Star families. We were one of two Democrats to have constitutional amendments on the ballot. You know, like that's the kind of results I want to bring as a state rep. Um, it's not just about filing bills. I don't have to tell y'all it's also about killing bills. You guys got to know, you know, how to call points of order and how to argue those points of order. Really bad legislation is going to come up next session, like really bad bills. And, you know, I really honestly don't want to see a lot of the stuff that we've been doing around cannabis be rolled back. Um, we need to keep pushing it forward. And that is that's an actual reality that I don't think a lot of people want to acknowledge is that even we even though we've come so incrementally far as far as the, the compassionate use program is concerned versus what is out there in the rest of the United States, that can easily with the same cast of characters, that could easily be yanked away. Yeah, teacup definitely needs to be expanded. I mean, we did a little bit this last session expanding who can qualify, which is great. Um, We're still having some issues around uh, the THC percentage. You know, like we're still, I mean, people don't like this when I say this, but it's, it's hemp. It's smokable hemp. I mean, we don't have a marijuana program in the state. It, I mean, yeah, it's 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 complicated for what it is, and we will go into that further after this this break we've got coming up. This is gonna be our next sponsor break here at the Lone Star Collective. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This is episode twenty-six. Our guest, Mihaela Plisa. We will be right back after this break.
We would like to take a moment to talk about the Texas Cannabis Policy Conference. The Texas Cannabis Policy Conference gathers thought leaders and experts in the rapidly changing landscape of cannabis legalization. The event, hosted at Texas A&M University, is happening this spring, March 4th through the 6th, 2022. Attendees will include cannabis business owners, entrepreneurs, investors, policymakers, and allied health professionals. For more information, event details, and registration, visit www.texascannabisconference.org. Oak Cliff Cultivators is a sponsor of Texas Cannabis Collective and Lone Star Collective Podcast. Oak Cliff focuses on quality assurance with their hemp products while providing customer service to help you discover cannabinoids to meet your needs. Their product line includes hemp flower pre-rolls, CBG tinctures, edibles, Delta 8, and merch. For more information on their products quality or to shop online today, visit oakcliffcultivators.com or contact them at info at oakcliffcultivators.com. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast, distributed on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Facebook, and much more, to give Texans information regarding policy, industry, and culture. Here is this week's host, Jesse Williams and Austin Sam Hariri. Welcome back to the Lone Star Collective Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Williams. This is episode 26. Joined by co-host Austin Sam Hariri. Our guest this week, Mihaela Plesa, running for Texas House District 70. We were talking about in our last segment about our teacup program and how it's not exactly the best medical program ever because it really isn't. But I'm I, sorry. I was rude. I shouldn't have said it's smokable hemp, but it's not acceptable. It's It's, it's not acceptable. And I think, and this, when I said it's complicated, is that I always had this this itching feeling in the back of my head that Texas was trying to do this in a way that it's not just an example. They would say how oh, other states need to do it, but that it was trying to somehow fit within right to try laws, the federal level compassionate use laws. And it's to me, it's become more prevalent. I think that that's what they're doing because DPS came out and said, well, we really don't think you lose your gun rights because of how we've set our program up we're pretty sure it's federally acceptable the way we've done it. And I'm like, to me, that's the only way you're going to get away with that is if you think it fits within right to try laws. And I wonder how we navigate that if we try to keep our program within a right to try federal level. Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of where you, you hit the, you hit it right on the head because whenever you start di diving into policy, right. Whenever you start really forming legislation and you start seeing okay, what's the intent of the bill, right? And that is where everything stems. So I, I agree with you. If we're trying to formulate bills to fit in a specific shape, then the outcome of what's going to come out on the other end is not going to be effective because the intent, intent of the bill is skewed to begin with. Um, I have a serious issue with, you know, my my fear is that, they're doing a little bit, the Republican Party is doing a little bit to keep people kind of like pacified so that they can hit the, the metrics to say, okay, Texas has a, a, a medical program without us saying like, we don't have a medical program. But I mean, it's, it's non-existent. Let's, let's be real here. I mean, we don't have an adequate medical program in the state. We do not have um, any kind of compassion for people that need this this medicine. And if it was working, then we wouldn't have the amount of people leaving the state of Texas every year to live in places like Colorado and New Mexico. I mean, Texas families are continuing to leave the state of Texas. They're moving to Oklahoma now. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I mean, yeah, I don't even want to talk about that, but. But I mean, we were talking about it earlier and, you know, there are states that this is the top priority. There are states that marijuana reform, cannabis reform is like HB1. And I don't we have to tell y'all, y'all know what. We have states 
governor is calling a special session just to legalize marijuana. And we we will be seeing that process play out on April 1st in New Mexico. And how is Texas going to deal with that with I-40 and I-10? Like, how is that, <laughs> how is that enforceable at, at all? Well, at this point, you know, my fear is that we are just promoting incarceration because it's kind of like we know that this is a medical issue. The states around us have said that this is a medical issue. They're profiting off of it, you know, for businesses as well, because it's recreational now. And we're still incarcerating people in our state for this. We are still denying people access to scholarships and grants and working opportunities. We are keeping people out of the workforce because of this issue. I, it does not make sense. So going back to the premise of what we were originally talking about, yes, it does lead one to question what the intent of these bills are. Yeah, we, so we, we, we get reached out to by people all across the state of Texas for reasons or one or another. And, and now when we look about, when we look at like, you know, drug arrests, um, this was a unique situation that had come up, which was uh, somebody had on April, on uh, December 31st on New Year's Eve been out, hadn't had anything to drink whatsoever. It's a, it's a, um, they get pulled over by the police. The police say, oh, well, will you blow in the, in the gun? They do. No, no test at all for alcohol. Pass all of the tests. Um, but then they test them and find that there's THC in their system. And they get charged with a DWI because they had THC in their system, which technically can be, can, that can exist. Like under seven the, days ago. Right. 30 well, days ago. <laughs> exactly. But they're getting that DWI because you had THC in your system and you were behind the wheel. Yeah, I mean, these things are an issue. And it, I mean, we need to do better as a state. Um, but we're going to have, a, you know, this, these issues aren't going to get resolved if we're still allowing people to take campaign contributions from people that profit from these types of bills. And we have like a really, really screwed up system, you guys. Like, I can tell y'all, you know, I've been on the advocate side. I've been on the staffer side, I'm the candidate now. It's it's so, you know, there's so much money going through these campaigns. There's so much stuff happening the day, the other days, not the 140 days that they're in session, right? There's a reason why they have fundraising moratoriums and all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Um, I want to decriminalize, you know, cannabis so that we don't have a need for all this crazy money going everywhere. We have another access to money. We have more money coming to the state. We have more revenue going into public education, more revenue going to help re rehabilitate people coming out of the criminal justice system, right? We need to use the money towards good instead of kind of always relying on bad money. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's funny that you you said good money versus bad money, and we had a committee hearing where somebody literally in the Senate had to sit there and go, we are legitimate businessmen, and we are not cartel members. Because our hemp program, they pretty much wanted to treat people as if they were that. And we mentioned, like, yeah, the THC thing in your system. THC is legal in Texas. People was like, but marijuana is not. It's legal, and we have it in our hemp program. It's 20 milligram gummies on the shelf right now in head shops. And it's perfectly yeah. legal because it's hemp-derived. But the issue there, see, once again, is because we don't have um, education around this issue in our state. We don't have it really within our government. I know that you guys do a great job coming to the Capitol and lobbying, and I know there's a lot of other organizations, but unless you really want to sit there and read the flyers and get informed on these issues, you don't know about the endocannabinoid system, right? And so... We should have THC in our system. We should have these things in our system. There could be studies to show that actually not having, you know, THC within your system at certain levels causes certain things because we're not feeding into our endocannabinoid system, right? So 
the whole conversation around this issue is skewed. It's wrong. Um, so when you get pulled over for having THC in your system and that's a crime, that's because the system is based on misinformation. Well, yes, for sure. Definitely, for but sure. Definitely built on incarceration, which is what we touched on earlier. And the education thing also comes down to a constituents being educated as well, because I know that there are offices that constituents could go in and talk, but yet they I would say they've said so much misinformation themselves about something that you have representatives and senators are like, I, I, don't, I don't know, kind of talk to the hand. I got other things to do. And it's, it puts people that do know what they're talking about at this horrible disadvantage to get things done as well. So we have the work people like myself and Austin had to work with, you said, with both advocates and representatives to try to squash oh, yeah. disinformation, make sure everybody's getting the knowledge they need to know to make a better case in front of our legislature. One thing we definitely learned is that just because they're there for cannabis doesn't mean that they have the same agenda as you and that there, there are many agendas that are like floating around and um, you, I don't have to explain. You already know. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, you know, that saying, don't meet your heroes. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, at the end of the day, look, this issue really needs to be resolved quick. Um, I don't know. I, I think in the house, you know, you have reps. I mean, this kind of stuff usually makes it through committee. And it usually makes it on the House floor. And, and and there is a conversation that usually, I mean, I, I remember Moody's been on the House floor a million times about this stuff. And, you know, so I, I know that it's being heard on the House floor. Our issue really needs to be how do we move it in the Senate? Because we can pass all the most amazing, beautiful, magnificent, best legislation out of this House. But it's going to die in the Senate. because. You know, Jose Menendez and, you know, Zaffarini, they can't like carry all the bills all the time. Like we need to start getting some of these Republican members um, to to tell Dan Patrick that like, hey, we really want this heard. Like this is just as important as the national anthem at sporting events. Oh, that's wow. <laughs> that was powerful. <laughs> the example I started giving people this year about, and we talked about how much money's flowing around, how important they want to put things, was that the concealed carry thing came up. And Dan Patrick went, well, no, we're not going to hear that. And the, like the first group that came out was police. They were, they were, he, he said, we are going to hear it. And the police union came out and immediately was like, we paid you money to not have this heard. And all of a sudden, it's changing direction. Then it's changing direction again because people have showed up. People came out and said, hey, this exactly what you said. This has to be heard. This needs to be on the floor. Yeah, no, people. So when I knock on doors, I've knocked on over 2,500 doors personally myself. Um, and when I knock on doors, like I said, I have on my literature, I have all my priorities. And one of my priorities is cannabis reform. And I specifically put that on there because I, like I said, I've worked on defense and veterans affairs. And this is an issue that veterans come into my office all the time to talk about. These are not Republicans or Democrats. These are people that served our country. They served the flag. They served, they sacrificed for us. And my heart breaks for them when they want to get off the stuff that's really hurting them, that's hurting their liver, their kidneys. And they want access to something that's safe and natural. And our state is preventing that. And then the second is the families that come in with the sick kids. Um, the kids that really, really, I mean, they've been to other states and they know that this medicine works and they can't access it here. And they're like, look, we brought our kid here. Like our kid is suffering right now. They're here to testify for this bill. Like, we have to go back immediately so that they can get their medicine because we're a criminal in this state, but that, but we want to come home. And so it's so important that we remove our child from a safe space, put them in a dangerous situation 
to tell our state legislators to stop what they're doing. We want to come home. You know, um, that's why I say it's important because like people are really suffering on this issue and, you know, people are having their lives ruined over this issue now. I mean, because we have cannabis legal in other states, um, people are getting access to these products and they're bringing them back into Texas. And a lot of them are people with these bait pens and that's a felony. That is going to ruin your life forever. And so, you know, that's why I put it on my lid. And that's why I'm having this conversation because it's not just about, you know, oh, let's legalize it for money. I mean, this is live or die in our state right now. I wanted to ask you if there was any other final talking points you wanted to get across as we wrap this segment up um, as well. Give you a chance to plug your website for your campaign. Well, no, I just, I'm really happy to be here. This is a great conversation. Anytime that I can talk about my roots and where I started from, you know, you guys said before, I have a grass root uh, operation. I like to call it a grass seed operation because we didn't really have a lot of roots at first. We have grown our roots organically. And, you know, as a, as a, young advocate at 18, 19. I mean, this was the issue that got me really, you know, driven. I was, like I said, I paid attention to what was happening in Canada with Mark Emery. I paid attention to what was happening in my own state with Ann Lee. And I realized that Texas is falling behind on this issue. So it's a very important issue for me. Um, I'm super excited to be here with you tonight to talk about House District 70, this new Dem pickup opportunity. You know, like I tell a lot of people, I'm a longtime listener, first time candidate, but I'm I'm very proud of the work that my campaign has done since we filed our treasurer, you know, in October. We've gained the endorsements of the Plano area Democrats, the Richardson area Democrats. I have the endorsements of state reps and former candidates that ran in this district. They believe in our message. They know that we are a strong candidate. You know, I'm the only candidate in my race that has legislative experience. Um, and I think that's going to be crucial, um, you know, when we go in on the House floor in January. So I'm just really excited to have the opportunity to talk about House District 70 and what's going on in Collin County. Because we're doing a lot of the hard work here. You know, they gerrymandered this district because they were scared of the work that Democrats are doing in this district. Um, but Democrats aren't going to be able to win this district alone. I'm going to need independents and I'm going to need some Republicans to understand that our state is suffering right now. And it's not about red or blue. It's about the issues. And I really want to fix our grid. I really want to bring money into our education system so that we can fully fund our schools. You know, one of my school districts, Plano ISD, is running a $40 million deficit because they've sent $150 million back in recapture. You know, I don't have an issue with recapture. I do have an issue with Republicans undermining public schools. And if they're going to take $190 million from Plano ISD, I don't want them to promote school vouchers with it. So, um, and I also want to expand healthcare, you know, whether that's cannabis or Medicaid or early childhood intervention programs in our state, we are still in the midst of a pandemic. And, you know, we people really want to get back to their normal lives. So that's why I'm running. Once again, you know, my name is Mahala Plisa. You can find me on all the social media platforms. I even have a TikTok, though I'm not very good at it. So don't expect <laughs> much. I try, but like it literally takes me 15 hours to make a 15 second video. So <laughs> like I just I, I try, but um, it's OK. We were the we were the dial up Internet generation. So we we created all of this for them. For sure. So my all the socials are Plisa for Texas, P-L-E-S-A for Texas. And my website is PlisaForTexas.com. 
you can have more information about me there. Um, I have like everything on there from all the events I've done, my policy platforms, and you can even go on there and endorse me. So send in your endorsements for my candidacy and early voting starts next week. You guys, Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day, show me some love at the polls. If you live in Collin County and election day is March 1st. So let's get out this vote. You can find her at plesa 4 texascom P L E S A F O R for four Texas T E X A S.com. So you can find out more information about her, Mihaela Plisa. She's running for House District 70. That is Colin in Dallas County, correct? It's only Colin. It's only Colin. It's literally, okay. it's only Colin. So it's I've got about, like I said, 13 precincts of North Dallas. So it's city of Dallas, but it's Collin County. Most of it, though, is Plano. And then I've got one precinct of Allen and one precinct of Richardson. So well, most they, of the district is Plano. They really did chop up that district pretty pretty sizably <laughs> they were scared about the movement so we just got to keep pushing well that's going to wrap it up for episode 26 here at the lone star collective i'm your host jesse williams joined by co-host austin zamhari our guest this week mihaela plisa running for house district 70 collin county plisa for everybody have a great day enjoy your week adios <laughs>